Okay, students. And now for part two of my lecture in chapter 12. Lecture, chapter 12, the Keynesian perspective, part two. So we learned in part one that the Keynesians strongly believe that demand is king, right? That equilibrium, that the equilibrium level of GDP in the economy depends critically on shopping by the four shoppers. The four shoppers being households, the government, firms, and the rest of the world, right? So shopping by the four shoppers is critical in maintaining the health of our economy. If the shoppers decrease their shopping, that leads to the AD curve shifting to the left. That leads to equilibrium GDP Y star being less than full employment GDP Y sub F, right? In other words, we have a recessionary gap, a recession. The unemployment rate climbs above 4%. In other words, we have cyclically unemployed workers in addition to the naturally unemployed. Correct? So to briefly show you what this looks like, this is a diagram that we will keep coming back to in this uh, class. So I'm not drawing your standard Keynesian aggregate supply curve, which is, as you learned, horizontal and then vertical only at full employment. I'm not going to do that. I'm just for simplicity drawing a standard, easy to recognize, positively sloped aggregate supply curve. So this is equilibrium GDP Y star. I'm sorry. That's real GDP Y star. This is uh, y, uh, the price level. Um, this is uh, Y star. And that is the equilibrium price level B star. Right, we have a recessionary gap here because YF is to the right of Y star. So that is the recessionary gap. This is the picture of an economy in recession. And this, of course, implies that the unemployment rate is greater than 4%, greater than the natural rate. Correct? Now, according to the Keynesians, this situation can be fixed. The economy can be brought back to full employment by stimulating we need to stimulate aggregate demand. So the aggregate demand curve that you see here in this diagram has to, according to the Keynesians, has to be shifted to the right like this. Correct? And if this were shifted far enough to the right, working backwards here, if the AD curve was shifted all the way to the right up to here, we would see that equilibrium GDP would equal full employment GDP. The recessionary gap would have been completely eliminated. Right? Uh, why do the Keynesians again believe that this has to be done? Because of sticky wages. That's key in our story. Do you remember this? Sticky wages. What sticky wages do is they prevent the aggregate supply curve from shifting to the right. You see, that would have been another way of narrowing that recessionary gap. But the aggregate supply curve is not going to shift to the right because despite high unemployment, wages are not going to fall. Sticky wages. Right. Now, I might have mentioned uh, that you know there are different reasons that the Keynesians put forth uh, to explain sticky wages. And one of the explanations Keynes himself came up with was unions. Labor unions would resist any fall in wages. Another argument that they used was called the efficiency wages argument. That even if workers were willing to work for less, unemployed workers were willing to work for less, firms may be reluctant to pay workers less because firms know that when they pay workers less, workers put in less effort workers become more inefficient. So to avoid that, which is, you know, inefficient workers are going to reduce firms' profits, right? So to avoid that, firms are reluctant to cut the pay of their workers. 
Right? So these are some of the explanations for sticky wages. Right? So my point here is that because we have sticky wages, the AS curve is not going to shift to the right, and so the AD curve has to be then deliberately shifted to the right by the means of fiscal policy and monetary policy. Correct? Fiscal policy is policy about government spending and taxes. And who controls this? The government. And when I say government, who do I mean? I mean the executive branch of government and the legislative branch of government, the president and Congress. Monetary policy I've mentioned is controlled by the Fed, the Federal Reserve. Right? So we need fiscal and monetary policy to shift the AD curve to the right. Correct? I am going to focus on fiscal policy now. Right? And this brings me to my discussion of the expenditure multiplier. the expenditure multiplier. So what economists have realized is that when, when let's say, government spending goes up by $1 as part of so-called expansionary fiscal policy. Now that's a new word there, expansionary. Expansionary meaning designed to expand aggregate demand, expand equilibrium GDP, designed to help pull an economy out of recession. In other words. So when government spending goes up as part of expansionary fiscal policy, now, do we understand that? Remember that government spending is a part of AD. So if the government wants to increase AD, the first thing it could do is increase its own shopping. Increase its own shopping, right? Increase government spending. So economists have realized, as I was saying, that when government spending goes up by $1, aggregate demand rises by more than $1. This is something that economists realize. So let's explain why this might happen. This is what's called the expenditure multiplier. Multiplier as in when government spending goes up by a buck, aggregate demand in the economy may go up by 10 bucks. In other words, this rightward shift here, this rightward shift here, this rightward shift might be $10 when the government spending that caused it to happen increased by only $1. Right? That's the expenditure multiplier. So let's understand the expenditure multiplier. Now, in your textbook, this is only mentioned. They don't get into the details of it, but I'm going now well beyond your textbook. Okay? Now, to understand the workings of the expenditure multiplier, we need to lay out some background. We need to introduce a term called the marginal propensity to consume. marginal propensity to consume, or the MPC, right? The marginal propensity to consume is basically defined as the fraction of any dollar increase in income spent by households on consumption. Right? For example, if the MPC was equal to 0 0.8, this would imply that a household would spend 80 cents of every one dollar increase in income, right? If they're spending 80 cents, this of course implies 
that the household is saving 20 cents, right? So in other words, a marginal propensity to consume of 0 0.8 implies a marginal propensity to save or MPS of 0 0.2, correct? Because if 80 cents is spent of every $1 increase in income, it must mean that 20 cents are being saved, right? So we have the following, that the MPC plus the MPS is equal to that $1, or, or simply equal to, to 1, right? So we need this necessary background. All right, so let's start our story the following way. So let's say that government spending goes up by $1. And let's say we're back in the days of the Great Depression. And if you know any history, any, any economic history of that period, you know that Franklin Roosevelt's government, FDR's government, began to spend money on highway construction and various other public works projects in that era in order to boost the economy right? His New Deal economic plans, right? So let's say government spending goes up by $1, and this is on highway construction, correct? So what is going to be the change in aggregate demand? Well, we know that G is a part of aggregate demand. So the moment government spending goes up by a dollar, right away aggregate demand rises by that $1. And that's because that, in fact, is the change in government spending. Government spending is a part of AD, right? AD consists of C, I, G, and X minus M. But the story doesn't end here, because that dollar that is spent by the government on highway construction will end up in the pockets of construction workers. The construction workers will have an extra dollar of money in their paychecks, correct? What will they do with would they do, construction workers do, with the extra one dollar of income? Well, if the MPC were 0 0.8, this is going to mean that the construction workers are going to spend 80 cents of that extra dollar of income on, let us say, bread from the baker. So we have an extra 80 cents worth of consumption spending now, triggered by the original one dollar increase in government spending. So 80 cents worth of bread is bought by the construction workers from the local baker. This means the baker now has an extra 80 cents of income. What does the baker do with the extra 80 cents of income? Well, since the MPC is 0.8, the baker is going to increase his consumption of meat from the butcher by how much? 80% of 80 cents, right? So how would you write that? That would be written as point. 8 times 0.8, or 0.8 squared, right? So this is what? This is the increase in the purchase of meat from the butcher by the baker. Correct? Now, do we understand why, how the MPC is coming into this? If the MPC is 0 0.8, this means that people are going to spend 80% of any increase of their income on consumption. So the butcher now has an extra 0.8 squared, which is basically 64 cents, 0.64 worth of income. And so the, big, the, the butcher is going to increase his consumption spending. Let's say he buys vegetables from the produce guy. So how much does he spend on vegetables? 80% of the increase of his income, which would be 80% of 0.8 squared, 0.8 cubed. And this story just goes on to infinity. Now, this series has a name. This is called a converging geometric series to infinity. So this is a converging geometric series to infinity. Converging because as you go out in the series, the numbers are becoming progressively smaller. Right? Can you add up these numbers? They go on forever. Can you add them up? Well, yes, you can, even though they go on forever. And that's because this is a converging series, meaning that as you get far enough out in the series, the numbers you're going to be adding on are going to be so small 
that they will make no difference to the sum. Right? And there is a formula for adding up a geometric series. Right? And what is the formula for the sum of such a series? The sum of such a series is the first number of the series. In our case, the first number is this, correct? So we take the first number of the series and we divide this by 1 minus the factor of the series. Now what's meant by the factor of the series? The factor of the series is the number that you multiply each number of the series by to get the next number. And what is the factor of our series? Clearly it's 0.8. Right? So this sum is essentially going to be 1 divided by 1 minus 0 0.8, which is 1 divided by 0 0.2, which is 5. So in other words, if government spending goes up by $1, if you have this, right, if you have this, well, this triggers this triggers changes like that, right? You have increases in consumption spending that are induced. That, correct, and all the others. So the point here is then that if we add up all of this, all of these increases in consumption spending, we arrive at a figure of $4. So when you add that to the original $1 increase in government spending, we end up with a total of $5. Right. So this is the expenditure multiplier in action. Government spending goes up by one buck, and that causes aggregate demand to increase by Many times one buck, five times one buck, five dollars. Correct? Now, if the MPC were not 0.8, but if the MPC were 0.9, if this number here were instead of being 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and by the way, many economists believe that that is the true MPC for the US, your average American spends 90% of any increase in his income, saves 10%. With 0.9, this number here this number here would be 0 0.9 in which case this number here would be 0 0.1 and that 5 would not be 5 it would be 10 so the multiply would be 10 right so in other words the bigger the mpc the bigger the multiplied effect of an increase in government spending <coughs> Right? So this brings us to the definition of something called the government spending multiplier. <clears throat> and the government spending multiplier in the story is 1 divided by 1 minus either 0.8 or 0.9. And what is that 0.8? It is the MPC. Correct? So this is the government spending multiplier. And what does it stand for in words? It's the increase in aggregate demand from a $1 increase in government spending, right? Next, let's talk about the tax multiplier, because that's the other aspect of fiscal policy, right? Fiscal policy consists of the government's policy in regard to its own spending and its taxes, the taxes it collects. All right, so let's discuss the effect of taxes. So in the old story, in the previous story, we increased government spending by $1, right? Let's do the same to taxes. Let's raise taxes by $1. Now with taxes going up by $1, people's disposable income decreases by that dollar, correct? Now, with a decrease in income, if people have a dollar less of income, what happens to their consumption spending? What happens to aggregate demand? 
Well, we've learned previously that if consumption, if, if income goes up, if disposable income rises, a little sub D stands for disposable, if disposable income rises by, by one dollar, this causes consumption spending to rise by, let's say, 0 0.9 if the marginal propensity to consume is 0 0.9, correct? But what about a decrease in disposable income? So what if instead of increasing, disposable income decreased? So if we have a decrease like this, right? Now, wouldn't that cause consumption spending to go down? And it would again go down by 90 cents. So, so this works both ways. When income goes up by a buck, people save 10 cents, spend 90 cents. If income goes down, they decrease their consumption, not by the full dollar, but by 90 cents, meaning that people dissave to the tune of 10 cents. Correct? So if income goes down, by one buck, consumption spending doesn't fall by the full buck, it falls by less than a buck, meaning that savings have to cushion the fall in income, if you know what I mean. Right, so this works both ways. So as a result of the one dollar decrease in uh, a rise in taxes, meaning a dollar decrease in disposable income, consumption spending is going to immediately fall by 90 cents. So the individuals buy a 90 cents less bread 90 cents worth less bread from the baker. The baker's income decreases by 90 cents. So he therefore buys less meat from the butcher to the tune of 90% of 90 cents, or 81 cents. Right? And the butcher then buys less produce to the tune of etc. Right? So we can add this up as follows. We can write this as a big minus sign in brackets and then 0.9 plus 0.9 square plus 0.9 cubed, etc. And this, of course, is using our formula for adding up a geometric series to infinity. The first number of the series is 0.9 divided by 1 minus the factor of the series is a 0.9. Correct? So this can be more generally written as minus the MPC divided by 1 minus the MPC. And this is the tax multiplier. And what's the definition of the tax multiplier? That's the change in aggregate demand from a $1 increase in taxes. Now you notice the minus sign there? The minus sign means this is a negative change. A negative change is a decrease. So when taxes go up, aggregate demand decreases. Conversely, when taxes go down, aggregate demand would increase. Right? So I've given you a sense of how these multipliers work. And let me now show you a problem or two. And these are PowerPoint lectures, and I think I have down here a practice problem. And let's see if we comprehend this practice problem. So it says, yeah, the government, government spending rises by $24 million. The marginal propensity to consume is 0.7. Calculate the resulting change in aggregate demand. Right? Now we know that with an MPC of 0.7, what's the government spending multiplier? The government spending multiplier is 1 divided by 1 minus the MPC, 1 divided by 1 minus 0 0.7, 1 divided by 0 0.3. Let's leave it at that. Right. What is the meaning of that? This means that if government spending rises by one dollar, aggregate demand would increase by one divided by 0 0.3 dollars. 
But in our case, government spending is rising by $24 million. But of course, $24 million is simply 24 million single dollars. And each of those single dollars has this impact on AD. So the change in aggregate demand would be the change in government spending times the size of the multiplier. Correct? So this would essentially be the plus 24 million, plus because this is a rise in government spending, right? So a rise is a positive change, correct? So plus 24 million times 1 divided by 0 0.3, and that's the calculation right there. And if you do this right, you arrive at essentially plus 80 million, correct? So we have a formula here, and that is change in aggregate demand is equal to change in government spending times the government spending multiplier, right? When the government spending falls, there'd be no difficulty here, except the change now is going to be a negative change. It falls by, so minus 100 million, right? And we need to multiply it by the government spending multiplier, which is 1 divided by 1 minus the MPC. In this case, the MPC is 0 0.5, so we put 0 0.5 there. Work out the math, and we have here, because of this minus sign, this entire product should be minus, and so there will be a decrease in aggregate amount to the tune of 200 million. Right, so the change in AD shall be a negative number, and that's because change in government spending has a minus sign in front of it, causing the entire product to have a negative value. Right? All right, so you have a sense now of how the expenditure multiplier works, correct? And now we come to the last part of our discussion of chapter 12, and that is the Phillips curve. All right, so let's now discuss the Phillips curve. Now, before I talk about the Phillips curve, let me go back to my aggregate demand, aggregate supply diagram. Real GDP, the price level, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, correct? This here is Y star, and let's say that YF, YF, meaning full employment real GDP, is to the right of Y star, and we have a recessionary gap. Now, if, because of the government's fiscal policy, or for that matter, the Fed's monetary policy, which of course consists of changing the interest rates. So the Fed took steps to lower the interest rate, lowercase letter R stands for the interest rate. Well, that too would cause consumption spending and investment spending to increase the AD curve to shift to the right, in other words. Correct? So if this AD curve were then made to shift to the right like this, bringing the economy ever closer to full employment, you would see the following happening. You would see a narrowing of this recessionary gap, correct? But we would also observe a rise in the equilibrium price level. So we have inflation happening at the same time that unemployment is decreasing, right? So we have the unemployment rate decreasing, but this is being combined with inflation. So this gave rise to a observation by an Australian 
economist called Phillips and this is what he discovered in data and he was using US data from the 60s right and he found that if he plotted the US unemployment rate on the horizontal axis and the rate of inflation on the vertical axis. Of course, you've learned from the chapter on inflation that the rate of inflation is simply the percentage change in the value of the CPI, for instance, or the GDP price index, right? Percentage increase in the cost of living. So he's found that uh, essentially as the AD curve is shifted to the right, the unemployment rate goes in that direction, approaches 4%, right? But at the same time, the price level rises, so we have a hike in inflation, right? So in other words, the curve that is traced out is like this. As unemployment has decreased, the rate of inflation climbs, right? So there is a trade-off. There's a trade-off between lower unemployment and lower inflation in the sense that you cannot have both. If you want lower unemployment, you have to trade off lower inflation, meaning you have to accept higher inflation. That was the idea behind the Phillips curve. So this is the Phillips curve. Why is it negatively sloped? The negative slope of the Phillips curve follows, in a sense, follows the positive slope of the AS curve, correct? Because as the AD curve shifts to the right here from AD here to AD prime to AD double prime, the aggregate demand curves are tracing out new equilibria along the positively sloped AS curve. So yes, equilibrium GDP is increasing, but at the same time, you have demand pull inflation, the price levels going up also, the equilibrium price level. So this is the Phillips curve. This is what Phillips observed from US data in the 60s. But the 70s were a different story. In the 1970s, the following happened. Right? In 1973 and in 1979, you had the two great oil shocks. And this basically means that the Middle Eastern countries are produce much of the world's oil, greatly increase the price of oil. They greatly increase the price of oil. Now, oil translates to energy. So energy prices went up. Uh, energy is a universal input, correct? So when the price of this universal raw material rises, what happens in our ADAS diagram? The real GDP, price level, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, correct? Now, what happens when you have a rise in energy prices, energy being a universal input. Now, isn't that going to, as we've just discussed in the beginning of part one of our lecture from chapter 12, that that's going to cause the aggregate supply curve to shift to the left. Like that. So what does that lead to? This implies, this implies that you're going to see a decrease in the equilibrium level of real GDP. So if this is YF, you're going to see a widening of the recessionary gap. So you're going to see unemployment increase as the recessionary gap widens. So the unemployment rate rises. But at the same time that this is happening, observe the effect on the equilibrium price level. Now, isn't the equilibrium price level also rising? So don't we have inflation here? What kind of inflation is this? It's called cost push inflation, as you remember. Cost push inflation. Right. So we have the unemployment rate rising and the inflation rate rising. And this would, of course, give rise to not a negatively sloped Phillips curve, but a positively sloped Phillips curve.
right? So if you put the the unemployment rate here and the inflation rate on the vertical axis with data from the 70s with this kind of stagflation going on, cost push inflation, we would observe a positive relationship, a rise in the unemployment rate associated with a rise in the rate of inflation. So when Phillips put in data, combined the data from the 60s and the 70s, remember the 60s gave him a negatively sloped Phillips curve, and the 70s would give rise to a positively sloped Phillips curve. So when he combined his data, he got no relationship. Right? Phillips ended up with nothing because the negative relationship of the 60s and the positive relationship of the 70s, in a sense, cancelled each other out. He ended up with a scatter of points. So the unemployment rate and the inflation rate, each dot represents data, US data from a particular year. So when you combine data from the 60s and the 70s, you basically ended up with the dots not tracing out either a negative relationship or a positive relationship. It was, it was a round cloud in a sense, no relationship. Right. So that's the Phillips curve. Now the chapter ends with, uh, you know, with a certain statement, and that is that even though Keynes believed that in times of recession, the government and the Fed had to take active steps to manage aggregate demand, to stimulate aggregate demand. In other words, there was a big role for government in the economy. Even though he believed this, he was not against markets. He believed that individual markets worked. There was no need for the government to interfere in the workings of individual markets. But at the level of the macroeconomy, there was a reason for the government to intervene because the economy would not fix itself. And the economy would not fix itself because the wage was sticky. You follow me? So even in a recession with high unemployment, the wage would not necessarily fall rapidly, causing the aggregate supply curve to shift to the right. That would not happen. Right? That's why the Great Depression didn't go away on its own. It only went away when government spending greatly increased with the World War uh, start, beginning. Of course, you know, FDR's New Deal efforts made some effect, had, had some impact in alleviating the recession. But it really, the recession, the, de the depression really disappeared only once government spending skyrocketed during the Second World War. Right? And that takes me to the end of part two of my lecture.